without further ado, I shall formally kick off this evening's event and uh, give you all an extremely warm welcome. We're delighted to have you here tonight for our talk with John Frearson, part two of his talk about James Spate of Sutton Coalfield and his family of photographers. I just hope you're all really comfy. And I think then what we'll do is I'll introduce John. So uh, many of you will have met him last week, but uh, John Frearson is a retired construction um, uh, materials consultant. Uh, but in his retirement, he's developed a brand new career that um, he's, uh, I think, fair to say, really enjoying as a local historian, uh, author, researcher, lecturer, uh, basically on a wide variety of aspects of local and family history. He lives in rugby and he's written a number of um, books uh, relating to different aspects of uh, rugby's local history and, and famous characters, including a spate photographer, not the one that we're going to be hearing about tonight, one we heard about or, um, in last week's talk. Uh, but tonight we're going to be hearing about the spate photographer from that family who set up business in Sutton Coldfield. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to John and we'll all give him a very warm round uh, of applause and say welcome John over to you. Thank you very much Zoe. Um, good evening ladies and gentlemen and I hope there's not too many of you who don't have a clue what we're talking about because you couldn't get to last week's installment. So James Spate in Sutton Coalfield and this week we're really going to look at his time in Sutton. Um, I hope I'm allowed to shorthand it to Sutton rather than Sutton Coalfield every time because otherwise I'll call it Sutton Co Courtney which is near my original home in Oxfordshire. If you recall James like many young men started as a young boy and was photographed by his father. We're now seeing him a little bit older than the picture in the centre, but we will be seeing him in the, uh, as he is here in a minute. Anyhow, this is the family a few years after James had moved to Sutton and we see him here back in rugby for the Christmas celebrations. They always gathered and took a, took a photograph. And in this case, unlike the one I showed you last week, James is in it. Don't know why his eye is blacked out, whether this is part of a cost, fancy dress costume or whether he'd injured his eye. Not an easy thing for a photographer. Anyhow, we have here the other residents of Sutton Coalfield, which is James Walker, who ran a chemist shop and photographers in the parade. I think he stopped doing photography when James arrived. His wife, who's the eldest Spate sister, so James's eldest sibling, and their son and daughter, Henry and Dora. And at this stage, rather a surprised 15 years later addition to the family, baby Charles. The rest of the, them are spate families, James's father and mother, his brother and his brother's fiance or wife, depending on the date, and one or two other spate brothers, Harry, Claire, both photographers, and Charles, of course, who is a photographer. Well, James's niece, Dora Walker, got photographed quite often by James. Um, and in the late 1800s below, when she was pretty young, um, and an early 1900s example, which is the only known example of a cabinet print. This is the larger card mount, about a bit bigger than a postcard. Um, James more or less gave up doing that sort of photograph um, at about this time. He either did postcards or mounted portraits or whatever on a, on a mount. But here we have the cabinet mount, not to be confused, the smaller carte de visite, which, which is a playing card size photograph, which James, to my knowledge, never indulged in. He did a lot of postcards. Um, 
and we're going to show you a few of them today because we've basically trawled up all the James Spate photos of Sutton that we can find. But if you have more, I'd be I'd love to see them. This is 1906, the Trinity Monday procession. Um, not a very good image because when you're researching, you grab any image you can, and it might be a very poor image from a website or an eBay site or whatever. But it tells us that he was there on Trinity Monday. We've got a better example from the Sutton Coalfield Library, obviously taken at the same event, but a rather better example. So you can see the difference in quality we have to put up with when we're looking at, at the internet sometimes. But you will see quite good quality photo, lots of information there. We could talk about that probably for a quarter of an hour, but um, if you came from Sutton, I couldn't. Well, looking at James's life, and he, as I met, on the, mentioned, he kept a diary, and so we know what he got up to. And on Whit Sunday, 3rd of June 1906, they went for two days in his friend Mr. Woodham's motor car. Arrived at Matlock at midday, we went on to Bakewell. On the 4th of June, they visited Chatworth's house. And here they are at Chatworth House, I think, um, with James in the back. So I'm assuming his brother-in-law took the picture, who he went with him as well. But a nice bit of motor car. Whit Tuesday, 1906, well, he was out with his camera again, and this was the fire in Sutton Park. Um, and helpfully, James one has titled his picture, two he has dated his picture. Do remember to do that on all your pictures so that your grandchildren and great grandchildren will actually know what on earth they're looking at. Later in July, he visit, James visited the Warwick pageant for the thousandth anniversary of the conquest of Mercia by Queen Thelfleda. Um, obviously, this isn't one of James's photographs. He didn't take a camera. We don't have any photographs, but he went to visit it and wrote it up in his, in his diary. August, he was on holiday in Devon and Cornwall. They got around these lads. Photography was quite a good trade. Um, you made some money, you could afford some holidays. So here he is in Ilfracombe, and we see HMS Montague aground on the rocks at nearby Lundy. Quite interesting photographs. They're in his photograph album, which is now in the Warwick County Record Office. Also in 1906, photographing local things, we've got a picture of the Pentland Robins in Sutton Park. This is named for George, sorry, Joseph George Pentland, printer and vice chairman of the Birmingham School Board. He founded the Bullring Mission, helping slum children, and as well as a sort of party in sort of January, February time, in the summer there was an outing to Sutton Park, and this is just some of those children. I don't know how many went out. I haven't been able to find a press report because the Sutton papers don't seem to be online at the moment, but I'm sure when the library is open, you'll be able to get there and tell me all about it. Again, fortunately, he gave us a title and a date. And then the next year, again, Trinity Monday for the procession, um, we've got uh, another photograph. And we don't know the date of this, but again, from the Sutton Library collection, um, moving the stocks in Sutton Coalfield. So rather a fun picture to have. He obviously got around and did local topical photographs, as well as sort of sitting in the studio taking portraits. And then the next Whit Sunday, again with Mr. Woodhams, he went off in the motor car. Um, 
and returned by way of Chester and Nantwich. This is his colleagues having a stroll on the sands. And usefully here, because we both know the date from his diary and what it is, we've got a rather good impression of his blind stamp, Spate Sutton Coalfield, which may help us to date other photographs, although we seem to use it for quite a long time. And this is one thing I'll be asking you if you've got photos with stamps or signatures and know who's there or knows the date, please let me see them. So January 1908, James commented how six years before when he first came to Sutton, see lecture one, there were only two company shops. There were now a dozen or so, including Smith's, Freedom Hardy, Hardy Willis and Boots arriving shortly quite an excitement. However, 1908, he had decided to build a new studio, which we see here, um, designed by Crouch and Butler, built by Moorehouses. And in his diary on the 27th of March, he says, on this day, I moved into new premises I have built on the parade. It is impossible to say what a relief it is to get away from Victoria Road. For six years, I have worked under great inconvenience and unsuitable premises. It was a mistake commencing in such a place. Well, he chose it, but again, his prefab previous studio kept him going and it obviously earned him enough that he could build this shop. Amazingly, or fortunately, he did a series of photographs of his shop and studio, which gives us a wonderful insight into what a studio at that time looked like. It's, well, not often you have this sort of set. Unfortunately, they knocked down the studio. Um, why it wasn't listed, I have no idea, but it is was a superb building. I've got quite a lot of these photos. I couldn't decide what to cut out, so I'll go through them fairly quickly, just saying what you're seeing, and later on when there'll be a chance probably to look at this online, you can always study them in more detail. Well, you go into the shop and studio and you go upstairs basically to where the studio exists and another set of the stairs and the lobby. Getting to the top of the stairs we can look into the studio and another view with some of the furniture which would be props. They might pose on them, pose next to them, lean on them, move them to be in the background and you can start seeing that in fact a lot of the lighting is natural lighting from windows in the roof and here we see those windows a bit more clearly and they've got muslin curtains so you can let light through but you can also stop bright sunshine but we've also got some lights. It's beginning to get modern. 1908, we're getting electricity. We've got a, a light frame up here. Um, we've got a small light here. We can still see the clock and the other furniture. Obviously done on one occasion, these photographs. Perhaps it wasn't so busy. We've got a camera on the stand here, um, other lighting and plenty of switches by the looks of things. So it looks as if you can control all sorts of lighting and get different lighting effects. And those who are asking about the Rembrandt print last week, um, which one of the audience kindly said what it was, and it was a way of lighting on one side and not so much the other. It was quite easy to light and thus was slightly cheaper per print than the normal cabinet prints. Here we see that the camera, it's on a big heavyweight trolley so he could move it around. So someone could have sat in this chair or at this table or whatever 
and the camera could be moved round, sheltered, and the lights coming in from the windows. Well, downstairs, we've got a mounting room, a lot of boxes of either glass negatives or filed negatives or whatever. Um, here we've got the workroom um, and uh, another mounting room with the press. So, and lots more boxes of slides. Um, the developing area and the printing room with a larger here to print the pictures. Obviously these could be blacked out, got blackout curtains here. <coughs> Again the enlarging room. Sorry I'm having to look at the computer next door to read these titles. And this is the workroom, the office and mounting room. So lots more things, no doubt, paper, mounts, somewhere to hang the coats, some parcels coming in or going out. Um, and again, the framing room. They made money framing, quite a lot of money, um, because not only did they photograph, then people would like to see, have their photographs framed, um, or perhaps other things framed. I, I quite often see photographs with a spate label on the back. I haven't seen one of James's, but uh, they have a label on the back saying mounted by spate. And here we see where they would do some of the sort of carpentry and such like. Again, the framing room and a lot more glass negatives on shelves. The mounting and storeroom. Again, more glass negatives. I mean, these may be waiting to be used. You'd have them ready um, in blackout boxes. We've actually got some of those which we recovered from his son's home, which had his brother's Claire Spates glass negatives of his postcards in them, about 180, which are now in Warwick Record Office, getting a, a mounting press here. And then the shop looks as if he's perhaps sold a few other items as well. We don't know, perhaps he could even print a photograph on them. Certainly they did it onto ivory and materials. And you can see the different framing types of samples of woodwork, samples of some of his work. And again, looking the other way, plenty of frames to look at. So having looked at where he did the work, we've got a few more of the lighter side of his, his work. Um, about 1910 on the left, we've got James Spate with four flatfish. Um, it needs a certain amount of sort of imagination to come up with a picture like that, but I think it's superb. Um, a real sort of giggle. You might remember me talking about Jape photographs when they dressed up and did all sorts of funny pictures um, in last week. And then here we have him going off to a fancy dress costume event before he was married with his niece and Dora, his niece, um, who lived just round the corner um, in Sutton Coalfield, they've obviously got dressed up as clowns to go off to a party. So we've got a few more pictures now of postcards. This is from the Masonic Hall Tower of, um, of the parade. Again, the parade and lower parade snatched off, you'll see from a, an eBay picture. So not very good quality, very poor resolution, but it told me he'd been there, he'd taken the picture. And then this is one which has been copied from an original 
by the JB archive, and they sell these, um, having removed the copyright information that James had put on it. And these are this photo is still in copyright until the end of 2047. Um, I'm just deciding, do I sue them as I own the copyright or not? Um, probably too much effort. Uh, anyhow, here's the church, Church Hill, Sutton Coalfield, another of Spate's photos. Um, the parish church. Again, here we're looking at a different, a, a different sort of writing. I mean, here it was capitals. Did he then go to the long script? Are we looking at a different style, a different date, or is it somebody different in the studio who did the some of the writing onto the negatives? This would, of course, have been in black ink so that when it was printed, it came out white. Another one of Parish Church, um, apparently a specimen, and this is from the Sutton Coalfield Library collection. Um, again, now we've got a more script title and the view from the Parish Church Tower, another specimen from the library collection. Thanks to Zoe for finding these and because I hadn't actually thought to get round to the library. I'd got so many spate pictures, various already. Um, I thought perhaps I'd got enough, but I hadn't. These are super examples. And I got another one of Park Road with lots of people. Um, the spates were well known for having people. Um, by this time, of course, they were doing rather better quality, faster film that they could get a picture with people in without it being all blurred. Um, but certainly in his father's time, his father was notable for getting people in and not blurring them. They were a very skilled family. The town hall, again from the library collection. And High Street, Sutton Coalfield, again, slightly different script. Um, if anybody can recognize what costume and what date that would be, but it was quite a while ago. And Bishop Vesey's Grammar School. And this particular one, which is puzzling us, and Zoe has been trying to work it out, of the meat at Sutton Coalfield. And we looked at this and all the carriages and didn't know whether it was going for a bit of fox hunting or what event it might be. And then it wasn't until Zoe pointed it out, because I hadn't really looked at it in any detail, there's a railway engine at the back. So I presume it's near the railway line. They tend to keep on those sort of things. Um, we need to know why that is there, what this event is, and has anybody got to the newspapers yet in the library? So a May Day event with the children at the Maypole, another poor, poor copy, but again, stolen from eBay. But we have got a different stamp here. It's not a stamp, it's actually a, a printed label, quite cleverly done with black on clear, stuck onto the negative to get a white on natural background. So we need to think when that might have been. The park entrance with a cow being led down from the park, sort of thing you take it for a walk I suppose. Powell's pool in the park, another poor quality one but at least we know the photograph was taken. And our friends from the uh, the copy people um, Again, Powell's Pool, Sutton Coalfield Park, no acknowledgement of James, but I think that's his writing. We're beginning to learn what it's like. Um, would be quite nice if it didn't have the text all over it, but uh, there we are. The research has to struggle with these things. So the swing in Sutton Park, um, could that be another event when the robins were there 
It might be, but we can't be sure. And the rectory park with a cricket match. You'll tell me later whether the rectory park is part of the park or whether it's a separate park. Excuse my ignorance. Now, April the 23rd, 1910, James got a bit enthused by Claude Graham White trying to beat the record from London to Manchester within 24 hours. You were allowed to have a break, presumably to refuel. This was taken when he'd got as far as rugby, um, and it's not one of James's pictures, but it is in the Warwick Record Office. Um, a little bit later, the wind got up and he came down at Litchfield and James cycled over there and talks about in his diary. And then he was going to start the next day if the wind wasn't too high, having refueled. So he got up at about 1.30 in the morning and cycled over to see him set off at about dawn. Unfortunately, the wind had managed to overturn the plane, which was in pieces. So he never did win the prize. It was won a couple of days later by a Frenchman who came over from France and then flew from London to Manchester, breaking the record and winning the um, newspaper's prize. I think it's £10,000, quite a lot of money. Um, but after that, Claude Graham White earned quite a lot of money from his aero nautics and shows and displays and he bought a bit of land at somewhere called Hendon and set up an aerodrome in Hendon and we all know what happened to that. Um, it became London's airport or one of them or the early early one of them. Um, it obviously moved a bit later on but it certainly was an important air base. May 1910, the proclamation of the king, George V, and this is the proclamation at um, Sutton, and we see this escort here keeping back the crowds where they'd roped in both the police and the fire brigade, um, which is always fun, and there's so much you can see on these pictures if you really study them, and the quality is superb, so you can often find all sorts of costume information, perhaps even recognize people. Now, I was talking about dating photographs. These are some of the stamps, signatures and such like you'll get on photographs and it becomes a bit more important later. Um, we saw this stamp in 1906, but it possibly went on later. This poor copy, and you'll see a better one in a minute. I lost it when I came to put this on, um, is a sort of at an angle stamp, which seemed to have used later on. We'll see this one in a minute, probably just sort of pre-war. Um, he signed some things with his own signature. And we also saw this J. Spate, the studio Sutton Coalfield, where he's obviously got a black on see-through to go onto the negative to print it. More research is needed, as I have said, I won't bore you. But here we see this particular white on or black on white, black on transparent print. And we think these are about 1913. A um, couple of army cadets probably getting ready to learn how to be killed in World War I. Um, and these are probably taken early in World War I because a lot of, a lot of portraits of soldiers, um, because of course, they all had a photograph in their new uniforms before they went off, a last photo with the family to remember them by. Um, these are quite nice enlargements on a fairly light background, um, quite clever dodging when you're printing to basically um, not let too much light through or mask it or not mask it um, so you can get a nice light background. 
very nice quality prints. But who they are, we've no idea. About 1915, we think it's meant to be a woman police constable. And again here, point out this later stamp. So it looks as if Spate was using that, assuming this is a 1915 um, postcard, um, that would suggest he started using this stamp about that sort of date. 1915, he got a card from Frank Eyre, who was then in the Royal Warwick Regiment, um, which we know because we looked him up. Um, I thought he might be a, related to the studio assistant, Miss Eyre at Rugby, but so far I haven't found a connection. However, fortunately, Frank was back on leave in 1916 when he got married. He was, by then he was a captain and we have no trace of him being killed. He seems to survive World War I. Quite a lot of people did. So January 1916, conscription began um, with the Military Service Act. Um, single men aged 18 to 40 years were liable to be called up for military service. And in 1916, James was a mere 36 years old. Um, so he was liable for service. Whether he was actually called up or whether he volunteered because he thought his time has come, we don't know. I think probably he was conscripted, waited for his turn. Um, but during the war, he did write home to the family, to the staff at the studio, and about 101 letters home have survived. And some have been read and recorded by James's son, Jack. We'll hear a couple in a minute, but they, they take a bit of time and I don't want to take too long. Anyhow, basic training. And this is Spate, James Spate at Catterick. He's circled himself and put JS and usefully said at Catterick. Pretty good clue that. And then this is taken probably at Andover. He volunteered for the heavy machine gun department. Thought that would be interesting. And you had to go for an interview. So that got you away from basic training for a bit and volunteered for tanks. But they were asked whether they knew anything about engines because really they wanted people who knew how mechanics and James had to admit he knew absolutely nothing of engines. And then they had an eye test which had to be done without your wearing your glasses. Um, James was as blind as a bat, he always said, without his glasses. So surprisingly, he was not selected. So he didn't become a tank operator or crewman. He joined the 20th Battalion of the Durham Light Infantry. So he was a, an infantry man and did one of his own portraits of himself in his uniform with his swagger stick. We have his medal card, which gives us a little bit of information, which sort of started us off on knowing where he was. DLI, Durham Light Infantry, a private. He then became a corporal still the same regimental number, which helps track him down. He then later, we'll see when he became a second lieutenant in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. And um, so he did get a commission. But in the meantime, on the 16th of June 1917, he went to France. And that meant he was too late to get the 1914-15 star. But at the end of the war, he did get the victory medal and the British War Medal. In fact, he got them twice because they got lost. He applied for them again in 1922. And finally, they arrived. In fact, both lots arrived. So he had to send one set back. I'm not quite sure who holds the medals. Um, it really wasn't until I was doing this talk that I suddenly thought, wait a minute. They must be somewhere which part of the family's got them. 
Anyhow, he was first in action in the third Battle of Ypres, 31st of July, 1917. I think this was Passchendaele, a very bloody event to clear the Germans from the high ground to the east of Ypres. Um, the 20th Battalion was involved in the first day's attacks, um, advancing along the Ypres Comine Canal. They lost eight officers and 431 other ranks that day. Well, he wrote back to the family to tell them that he had been over the top with the DLI. Um, he couldn't write until this fair and still August. And then we do have a, a letter from him saying, dear father and mother and Harry, his brother, who was at home at that stage, this is my first letter for almost three weeks. It's been impossible to write before. And so the Daily Mail mentioned the Durhams in the Flanders push. Yes, I've been over the top and had the best of luck, not a scratch. My luck has been wonderful for our battalion had some bad luck with shells and some hidden snipers and machine guns. But my four pals are missing, which makes a great difference to my life here. However, here I am once again, where there is green grass and the trees have leaves and branches. He was obviously been relieved and gone, not on leave, but had gone back behind the lines to have some rest. Uh, he was, went over the top in another push on the 21st of September, writing eight days later to his sister Lizzie. And this was General Plummer's advance. So we can actually hear his son Jack reading from the letter. September 29th, 1970. Your letter of the 24th just received. Many thanks, but I have a spare shirt and cannot carry any more. No doubt you saw the honourable mention in Haig's dispatch of the Durhams in the advance on September the 20th. That was our battalion. I have asked Miss Wise to obtain back copies of the newspaper reports for me. Yes, once again I have been over the top, and here I am, the same as in I went. I have been more lucky than I can possibly tell you. Words are quite inadequate for some occasions. This time I experienced much more of the real horrors of modern warfare, and over some sites one tries to draw a veil. What shall I tell you? Give a little description of the advances seen by me as dawn was breaking. It was an enthralling sight. We were in the support trenches on top of a high ridge with a view of the country for many miles in all directions. It is slightly undulating like Warwickshire. Our barrage commenced whilst it was still dark. Such a barrage. Remember that we are between our guns and the enemy. To make oneself heard, one had to yell as hard as one could. As dawn broke, we crept out of our holes and stood on top. What a drama. What accessories. What effects. To our backs, the hillsides covered with spurts of flame from countless guns. The early sun sometimes lighting up the old historic ruined town in a most ghostly fashion. To the front, a great bank of smoke where the shells were dropping. Slowly the drama developed. On the right, a long file of German prisoners came slowly into our lines, passing our engineers going in the other direction, carrying duck boards. Oh, those thrice blessed duck boards. On the left, our wounded on stretchers carried by more German captives. Then there were such side shows as seven or eight tanks creeping around us, up and down shell holes, seesaw fashion. Two large fires in the distance. Our sightseeing was interspersed with trench digging, and then move forward the Durhams. All went well until we had to shelter from heavy fire in shell holes, and in consequence lost touch two platoons with the company. After a lot of trouble, we left and set off. This is where I had my best luck, for we had to cross very marshy ground, just raked by enemy snipers and machine guns. At one spot we went down like nine pins, officer, sergeant, and six or seven men. I hugged Mother Earth to my bosom, not much earth either, for I was up to my middle in water, but there I had to remain till dark. I felt very happy when I safely reached the company. 
The things in my pockets, notes, eyeglasses, etc., were in an awful mess. It was not until next day, when taking the cover off my mess tin, that I knew how lucky I had been. There was a bullet hole in both sides of it. Why it did not enter my back, I cannot understand. I will continue the story to either Claire or Gull. The three days we were up there were exceedingly enervating. As a reward, they have given us a long motor ride, and I am writing this in the nicest trench possible, whilst on the softest guard I have ever done. The deep blue sea comes within a dozen yards of us, and I had a glorious swim this morning. The weather is charming. Hey-ho, is there a war on? Your affectionate brother, Jim. Well, not long after that, in November, um, the Durhams were moved to Italy because things were going a little bit against the Italians at that stage. Um, and this is a letter he wrote when he just got to Italy. Um, just my word, it's the marching we have done since detraining. Over a hundred miles in nine days, and that includes one day's rest. I believe we did over 75 miles in four days. This in full marching order, which includes waterproof sheet, leather jerkin, etc. So he was in Italy for a while, and we got a few letters from Italy. Um, meanwhile, Christmas was spent in Italy. This is the 41st Division card from Corporal Spate. He's been promoted to Corporal now, as you can see at the bottom of the Christmas card. Lists some of the actions that they've been involved with. Um, I think actually 1917, because this was later parts of the Somme. Um, but the post office was amazing. Um, this is a an envelope showing it on its way, trying to get from home to a soldier. Um, it was in his collection. I can't find the spate. It's so, so difficult to see. He might have been writing it to somebody else. But you can just see how many things, how many forwardings there were as the, the letters pursued the regiments as they were posted. Um, James Spate, by the way, had his local baker post loaves of bread to him each week, two loaves of bread. And he said he didn't know how soldiers managed who weren't able to afford those extra stores, which he also shared fairly generously with his particular section. Again in France, another letter from James, um, just returning to France from Italy. I'm sitting, this was in a farmyard. Um, I'm sitting in one writing this and the odor is surprising. Um, just yesterday was the limit. They were pumping up liquid from a well for spraying on the fields, I suppose. Phew, some smell. Um, he has it in for the French a little bit as James. Um, they were in, again in the land of mud and, shall I say, farmyard stinks up there. Um, I think he quite liked Italy. And then in April 1918, writing to the staff at the studio after a fighting retreat. And this was the German spring offensive Operation Michael started on the 21st of March. And as you can see from the map, the progressive lines of 21st, 23rd, 26th and 4th of April as the Germans pushed forward. Um, they nearly made it, um, but they were stopped. But we have James, again, in a letter read by his son, describing a little bit of this. So turn your sound up if it wasn't live enough last time, and we'll just see if we can hear this. April the 8th. Dear Miss Wise and everyone, I have just discovered your letter of March the 22nd in my pocket. It is very dirty and no wonder. When you receive this reply, you will already know that I have been through the exciting experience of a fighting retreat or rearguard action. Not a scratch. Am I not a marvel? 
Life in the past fortnight has been very trying. By word of mouth, I could give you only the faintest idea of it, how much less by letter. Our officer has just read out an extract from the Times of April the 3rd, which mentions us. I want you to please get a copy and keep it for me. I hardly know what to tell you. About rations in a push, how will that do? It is a fearful difficulty. The first day we had none at all. One can get along all right without food, but without water it's the very deuce. I chewed chewing gum till my gums were sore. They are not right yet. Then adopted a small pebble. But our rations came through about midnight. We kept them till daylight, and then I tried to serve them out equally to about thirty men, some in my trench and some in shell holes close by. Plenty of bread, but very little, such as tins of McConaughey's to go with it. So this I served out in little pats on the bread. Even then, a lot of them could not eat. Such is the effect on the stomach of great excitement. I might say I did eat. And one petrol can of cold tea. It was about two swallows for each man. The tin was passed round. It was cruel to snatch the tin from them, but it had to be done. Later on in the day we got two more tins full, and at my suggestion each man's quantity was put in his mess tin lid. Then he did what he liked with it. I put mine in my water bottle, and about every half hour took a large mouthful, kept it in the mouth as though I were cleaning my teeth, and then slowly let it down the throat. Bless! All's well that ends well. We were relieved that night. I trust you received my letter about a possible visit from Claire and Charlie. If they come, I hope you will make every possible use of their advice and criticism. Give Harry a rise by all means. We have been dismissed, the old hands, early, 3 p.m. And I'm going to have a snooze. I really can't write any more. Kindest regards to you all. Yours sincerely, J.S. Well, after his performance in the uh, the various battles and the, the fighting retreat, which they did manage to stop the Germans at that point, hold them and then go on to the 100 days advance. But probably before that, James had been selected for officer training. They obviously felt as a senior man and who'd already been a corporal, perhaps he could be an officer. They lost an awful lot. Anyhow, this is near Swindon, waiting for his posting to the officer cadet battalion. And we see him in a few photographs with the white hat band of an officer cadet, still with his Durham Light Infantry badge, but it, and it looked as, as if it was a group of Durham Light Infantry men who'd been selected for that particular course. And here we see him again in a group photo. Um, he'd very helpfully circled himself, and I've circled it again, make it a bit clearer. We don't know the event, but it looks as if their particular group had won quite a lot of cups. So perhaps they did quite well. Well, the 11th of November came and the armistice, and they had a very celebratory evening. Indeed, a later recording states that James slept the night in the company's incinerator pit, fast asleep. But by the morning, they were up and about, but they didn't wish to parade as normal um, on the first day of peace. In fact, they formed up and marched into Richmond. They gathered a band on the way and off they went down to Richmond, the nearest town. Um, they parade in Richmond, presented arms with their non-existent arms, just their swagger sticks and made a general salute. And after various escapades, presumably having 
liquid refreshment, they marched back to camp. Whilst they were reprimanded, no action was taken. It was a thing called armistice. And it's amazing, we've got those two photographs of the event, and it was written up later in Stand to the magazine of the Western Front Association. Well, by 1919, he was still in the army, but in March, James got his commission as a temporary second lieutenant in the Royal Warwickshire Regiment. Now, a lot of these letters and a summary of his life have been published in this book called Gentleman Jim of the 20th DLI um, by one of his sort of grand nephews in law, Simon Jarman. Um, the first quarter or so of the book is in fact a straight copy of my report on James Spate's life taken from the research report. Um, unfortunately, they didn't think to edit out things where it re referred to an appendix or to a figure or whatever. So it does read a bit lumpily. And then there's various of the letters have been tr transcribed, not all of them, and one of them twice. Um, and various summaries of the actions he was in and the various other bits and pieces. So that's all quite a, a bit, but I think I've told you most of what's in this particular bit of commentary. So I won't read the, the closing commentary from his son. Anyway, he got back to the studio fairly soon and was again photographing all manner of things. Again, we're not quite sure of the dates. There isn't a stamp or a signature. And the same here, there's a family group in the studio. You know, was it later? Was it earlier? Well, it might be earlier, you see. It's got the square stamp. We know that was in 1906. So are these costumes early enough to be pre-First World War? They might be. I'm not a costume expert, but perhaps somebody will advise me sometime. And I might get round to doing a bit more work on it. And here's a wedding group. But this is just signed on the mount. It's an enlargement and the fairly standard type of picture that he would take. This obviously done on location. It's not in his studio. The <laughs> roof's too high, but he would go out to take photos as well. And then in 1920, we get his own wedding. And here's James with his wife best man, his brother Charles, and his wife. Who took the photo? We don't know, probably somebody from the studio, perhaps one of their assistants. And we can't find any else of the family on it. Um, I think there's his wife's family. I think that's his wife's father and probably mother. Um, my other half thinks this chap is a spate, and I say, no, don't recognize him. Um, so we don't know. We've got to go back to the report of the wedding when I get on to the newspapers and, and see what we can find. Research goes on. We're you know, in an early stage, really, on researching James. This is his wife, Cecilia. And by 1922, he'd got a first son. This is John, known as Jack, Jack Hill, um, with his mother. And my gosh, talk about a, a bonny bouncing baby. He's certainly a large size. And, and, and we know, of course, we see the stamp, this angled, angled stamp. So we know it was least being used in 1922, which might help us elsewhere. Again, the whole family at about that stage. Um, again, the, the, the stamp on the angle. Um, eldest son looking a bit smaller there um, and part of the, his wife's family. James at the back. Looking none the worse for wear from his service in World War I. And he survived without a scratch. I mean, he was absolutely amazed about that. 
Well, James was a founder member of the Birmingham District Professional Photographers Association, which became the Institution of British Photographers and became its president in 1927. And in the 20s and 30s, he was active in the Chamber of Trade. He was connected with a number of local organizations. He was a founder member of the Sutton Coalfield Rotary Club. Um, so I'm glad they helped sponsor this series of talks. He was also in the Civic Society and the Friends of the Park Association. These from a, a much later report. Now, in 1928 or 1930, he took various photos of Pipe Hayes Hall. Um, they're all similar. They're all the same sort of writing on them. They may have been taken a bit earlier because I think when I found these, I didn't see the back, but they were given a date. And I had this one as both 1928 and 1930. And you can see there's obviously a, a postmark on the back and a pretty heavy one at that. So I suspect probably it was taken, I don't know, 1925, 26, and then people, sent them when they were visiting the place. Another one with a bit of sports out the front. It became a residential children's home, but I think that would have been later. Um, again, another, another view, the spate stamp um, and a, the, the white nursery. So again, it was later a children's home. So are these pictures actually as late as 1949? They may be, we don't know. Um, work to be done. Just looking at the day-to-day -day business, he was obviously not developing all the photos that came in. He did his own obviously, but he would send a roll of film off to CeeLo and he had his own mount, his own wallet, James Spate, photographic dealer, parade at Sutton Coalfield. And a folder that he would put his own pictures in, a portrait by James Spate. Always nice to have these little bits that just put a bit of extra information. We think this is from the 1940s. It's written on the back to dear Auntie Floss with love from Lily. If anybody knows who Auntie Floss and Lily are, it would be lovely to know. It would help date it. We have his headed paper from 1943. They've got the telephone 2054 Sutton Coalfield. Um, you see him photographer, framer of pictures, photographic dealer. So those were the key things. It wasn't just photography. And one, two pictures I do have dates for, from 1943 or 44, and one from 1947, of a girl, Jill Montgomery. She saw my newspaper article wanting to get information on the Spate families when I started my research and got in touch. And I went down to see her and sort of looked at her photographs by James Spate. She'd obviously moved from Cole, Sutton Coalfield to rugby. Um, so I sat on the floor with my laptop and scanner and scanned them. Superb examples. But again, we can see this particular signature from the 40s and we see him signing it on this color, colored print, which Probably he'd colored himself unless he had an artist who helped with it, but they're, they're superb examples. In the 50s and 60s, they went on holidays, they had a car, and here's James with his binoculars. One always wears a three-piece suit and one's tie, of course, when one goes on holiday. What gent would go on holiday without a suit? <laughs> They also went camping with the family at earlier stages in a sort of portable or mobile railway carriage. They were parked on various scenic sidings and you could go up and these railway carriages were done out as a sort of basically a caravan. 
and we have a photo somewhere. I haven't laid my hand on it recently. So here's the family a little bit later, um, James and Cecilia in the middle um, and their children. Um, on the right, Jack, who was born in 1922. In the center, Sylvia, who was born in 1924. And on the left, Richard Dick, who was my main contact, who was born in 1926. Um, a wonderful character, Dick. Um, we might just look at them a bit, just to look at the children, a couple of slides. Jack Spate went into the Navy. I think that was probably national service because it, by 1940, he'd have been 18. Yes, was he called up? Could well have been, I don't know. Um, and then became an architect. And I've seen some of his drawings, it's superb. Um, he obviously designed his gravestone and that's what I call a really nice bit of artwork. So he obviously designed that and had it, whether he had it made before he, he died, I don't know. They planned things, these spates. It wouldn't surprise me in the least. No, he needed the other date, so uh, it wouldn't be. He was a great traveler, um, a great collector of postcards. He visited Europe a great deal and collected postcards of buildings, architecture, pictures. I've got a pile about 10 inches high of his postcard collection. Um, I don't quite know what to do with them. If anybody's an avid postcard collector of architecture and art, um, do get in touch. It'd be nice for them to go somewhere rather than being recycled. The younger son, I don't know much about the daughter. Um, the younger son, Dick Spate, was born in 26. He went into the hotel business and he owned the Fernie Lodge Hotel and Restaurant near Market Harbour. Decorated with family photographs, it led to the erroneous reports that um, because of its location, many of the photos would be by Gulliver Spate, who worked in Market Harbour. In fact, they weren't. They were mainly by other members of the family, um, a lot of them being blown up versions of Claire Spate's postcard sets of rugby and various other towns and literary connections. Um, anyhow, Dick allowed access to his family collection when I got in touch with him via a relative in Australia. And they said, she said, oh, I think there's somebody still allowed in Sutton Coalfield. So I did a bit of investigating and wrote to him and they were superbly welcoming. Um, and his, he sponsored the research report um, so that they could have some copies of it. And a lot of his collection of spate material was given into my care, um, including the glass negatives, James's diary, um, James's book reading list, and lots of postcards and other things. And they're now in the Warwick County Record Office. Chris Walker, the grandson of the eldest sister of Lizzie, recalled James at Banktop. We saw much of Uncle Jim and Auntie Sis. As a boy, I would often call on my bike. If Jim spotted me, there'd be a roar of recognition. He'd come to the door on his stick. Come in, my boy, come in, and let's hear all the news. Aunt Sis was rather more reserved. They would put on huge Christmas dinners. Jack and Dick were much older than me, and they were always friendly. I often saw Uncle Jim passing our house at one Driffold, towards lunchtime on his way down to Sutton Coalfield Town Centre. Just popping down to the museum, he would cry up to me. I didn't know then that the museum was a pub where Jim reputedly held court with any young ladies present. So 1950, and we're getting near the end, if the seats are getting hard. Um, this was his just before retirement when he sold the studio. And these were some of the toys that he used to entertain child sitters. They would play with them. They would be distracted from the camera. They'd even sit still. Um, 
a wonderful collection. They were, this photo was published in the newspaper. And here's, James is holding this cow. This was his favorite. I think it was, you pulled the tail and it moved. It was the only toy that wasn't sold and it remains in the family collection. I was able to see it and photograph it myself when I was visiting them to copy everything. Some of the best photographs were in the downstairs toilet. Um, I had to take them all off the wall one by one and go and scan them because there was all sorts of interesting things. Some of which I had to take out of the frames to get to the backs to see what the dates were. Anyhow, James and his cow, um, their golden wedding in 1970, still looking pretty fit considering. And James Spate's last wishes in 1943 and 1960 and 1953, I think it is. Um, no flowers, my body to cremate it is possible. My ashes to be buried in Sutton Coalfield Cemetery, a plain granite, English stone, no epitaph or religious matters. Considering how religious he had been in his youth, he certainly wasn't in his older age. Um, perhaps the war had really driven that out of him. State the number of years I have been in business as a photographer in Sutton Coalfield, all letters to be cut deeply. State the years from 1902 to 1950. And that he wrote in November 1953, but of course he updated it again. He lived until he was 97 years old in 1977. And as you say, these, this talk can only be a summary. Dick sponsored the 167 page research report, it's A4 and got a lot of the pictures I've used in this talk in it, um, but he helped. Um, it has now expanded and now has 274 pages and still growing, but uh, there is a smaller version as an A5 booklet, um, which has the various family photos, the photo on the cover taken by James, his father with the pocket camera doing a selfie and the various brothers and sisters. Thank you very, very much indeed, John. It's been a, a wonderful talk once again and uh, lovely to see so many uh, gorgeous photos of Sutton Coldfield. I can hear everybody giving you one more round of applause and saying thank you ever so much for a really entertaining uh, and interesting talk. If you enjoyed the um, audio clips uh, John played for us, uh, they and many more are now on the Folio website. Thanks to John uh, sharing them with us. Um, and I can make sure that the link goes out in tomorrow's email address, uh, email to you all so that you can you can listen to the letters and also that recording from last week from the Rotary Club. Um, as I say, when you go tonight, that little survey will pop up. Please do take the time to uh, give us a bit of feedback about tonight. And if you're interested in volunteering or didn't answer the questions about um, how we can make our events um, uh, feel comfortable for you going forward in light of COVID and everything, um, uh, I'd appreciate that. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining me tonight, for joining John. And um, I look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully later in the month at another Folio event. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.